Okay, so good morning, everybody, and a special welcome to our primary audience, who is the China University of Technology. And welcome to our talk today, which forms part of our Changing Hearts and Minds, Exploring Environmental Education in Africa series. Now, sound is a powerful force that, along with being able to bring that sense of peace and well-being, can also make human beings love, cry, and in some cases, even hurt. The nervous system controls the body as it receives information from the brain, essentially telling separate parts of the body how to react in a given situation. For example, this morning when you heard the sound of your alarm, your whole body reacted to it. But a variation of the same sound can send a signal to the brain, making you feel excited. Because in its simplest form, sounds are waves or vibrations that ripple through the air and provide human beings with one of the most effective and vital ways we have of communicating with the nervous system of other creatures, including other people. And as stated by Brian McGill, one of the most sincere forms of respect is actually listening to what another person has to say. And somebody who knows the value of listening all too well is our speaker today, Paul De Brain. Paul graduated from Rhodes University with a Bachelor of Commerce degree, majoring in business administration, mercantile, and the economics of agriculture. He went on to complete an AEP at UNISA and has been intimately involved with rural communities for the past 40 years over a broad front, particularly in the land rights matters. Paul is the founder of the company. Pala Forerunners. Pala Forerunners has pioneered and defined a needs analysis methodology process over the past 25 years. And the purpose of today's talk is to present this methodology and also the lessons learned over the years. So with that, I now hand over to you, Paul. Good morning. Thank you, Aisha. And good morning to everybody that's... Uh, um, here for this presentation um it yeah it is a learning um to listen is is a key to addressing uh, somebody's needs um way too often we we find that um a community is not listened to and often uh, the government departments are, are guilty of assuming that they require whatever they do require and then they go and build uh, what they believe to be required and and in no time at all you'll see that it's a white elephant and unfortunately that has got progressively worse and so we need to um, find the road again we need to get back onto the road where uh, we can listen to communities uh, articulate their needs and prioritize their needs. And that's what this presentation is about. Okay, Kirsten, if you could go to the next one, thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, so we started with the Dixie community um, around 1999. And um, we we very soon found out that there was a multitude of needs that were expressed by the community. If you listen to the, the young uh, men, they needed a soccer field. If you listen to the young women, they needed, or the young mothers, they needed a creche. If you listen to the gogos, they needed a vegetable garden. And, and so everybody within a community has needs. And the challenge was to find a way of navigating these needs uh, and prioritizing them. Um, and you see there, if you, if, um, Lewis Carroll's quote, if you don't know where you are going, it doesn't matter which road you take. And sadly, that's, that seems to be the situation right now. And if you look at Terry Pratchett's quote, if you don't know 
where you come from, then you don't know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, then you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, you're probably going wrong. Uh, and that is so true. And I hope that I can illustrate that today um, through this presentation. Thanks, Kirsten. Okay, there are a number of reasons why we conduct these needs analyses. Um, we operate in a, uh, an area that adjoins the Kruger Park, it uh, adjoins the Sabi Sand, and it adjoins the uh, Manioleti Game Reserves. So um, just the survival of, of those reserves is uh, dependent on good neighborliness with the communities that live there. Uh, it's estimated that 47% uh, of the people uh, in that area uh, suffer from malnutrition. The unemployment rates are, are sky high. Um, and so it's, it's the duty of the landholders, which includes the South African government, and then all the lodge operators to, to listen and take an interest, a real interest, in the, the needs of the communities um, that are their neighbors. So the, the purpose for the needs analysis is amongst others to identify the socioeconomic development priorities for each community. Uh, the, the possible uh, socioeconomic development plans in each community, as you do the needs analysis, you, you, you see a picture uh, developing and um, yeah, so the the whole process is aimed at getting a a final painting of what the community really needs, uh, and in in that process, uh, you you start developing plans. In the interviews, we uh, we ask every person that's interviewed, we ask them, um, what experience have you had? What training have you had? Um, and we, we pull those people according to the development plan that we established for the community. You'll see just now we'll get to the Dixie community and you can see how powerful that approach is. Um, then there's priorities that are, need to be brought to the urgent attention of government. Uh, when we did these needs analysis in 2003, we had uh, um, we approached the Department of Water Affairs. Junior Potloani was the Director General, and uh, Mr. Ronnie Casrols was then the the Minister of Water Affairs. and And we we engaged with them on the challenges that we found in these communities, and we had fabulous support from the government. I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, just now. Um, and then, yeah, it, uh, a lot of this revolves around water supplies and the sustainability of water supplies. We work in a, a 3,000 square kilometer area. Uh, there are 500 uh, government installed boreholes, of which uh, 400 uh, at the time of doing these uh, needs analyses, 400 weren't working. Uh, we've engaged with the, the Department of Water Affairs, uh, uh, Rand Water, who were the agents um, here in this area, Sulumanzi. Uh, it's just this decreasing budget available to address these problems. Um, and so that, that creates a lot of tension. Um, we do a lot of work with orphans and vulnerable children uh, and supporting the agencies uh, that look after them. We, we, it's an enabling environment. We, we don't go and invest tons of money. We just uh, oil the wheels. So for example, they, they have a big challenge with nutrition and fresh food. So we have a deal with the wholesale nursery here in White River, and we transport out uh, seedlings to uh, over 50 uh, drop-in centers, uh, creches, um, and home-based care organizations, and uh, they then grow their own vegetables. And obviously, water is a key component in that. 
Um, we also identify members who require home-based care um, and we try and get them under an umbrella of care uh, from within the community. And just on that, it's the, the purpose of the needs analysis at the end of the day is to develop community plans uh, for the community and by the community. So we're a, a facilitating agent um, and, and just empower communities. Uh, we, we've done a lot of eyesight testing um, and provided lenses and glasses. Uh, and we've also done uh, hearing testing. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's in a nutshell what, what we have been doing for the past 20 years. And there was one youngster, um, we arrived at Seville where we did a needs analysis and um, the, one of the community development forum members asked me if I would mind to see somebody who uh, was an orphan and young, and, but he had a disfigured face. And I said, yeah, of course. And he said, but you mustn't get a fright. And I said, of course not. And it was a sight to behold. Opa Matabula had a, a, gray, uh, a bony mass tumor uh, that was um, threatening his eyesight in one eye and also um, making it difficult for him to, to breathe properly. So I just said to him, and that's, that's really the approach that we have is, um, he, he was so scared and so nervous. Um, and I just said to him, Opa, we're not, I'm not sure what I can do, but I, I, I would like to take some photographs if you don't mind, and then we will, um we'll see what we can do anyway the photographs went off the next day i had them developed that was in the old days with film and uh sent to our gp and my gp in johannesburg and she happened to know dr martin keely at sunning hill clinic um who who said bring him up and uh dr martin keely is one of two uh surgeons that specialize in that field at the time and anyway cut, cut a long story short uh Opa was operated on he had i think five operations in total and um yeah he's he's now 23 years old uh 20 no probably older 25 but in, in any event um the word got around johannesburg and i was invited to go on to 702 radio and um, people were amazed that this little youngster had been discovered and there's just there seems to be a divide between uh, our, our metropolitan areas and the, the rural areas um, but I went on to Tim Odise's 702 chat show for an hour and they said well how can they help so I said well this youngster uh, Opa, he was wearing my son's clothes because he didn't have much in the way of clothes. And um, so we arranged a drop-off point, um, which is either the 702 offices or or at Sunning Hill Clinic. And um, well, within three days, we had eight tons of clothes for Opa. So it just shows that there's, and, and South Africa's like that. And that's what what I'm really happy about. At the moment, we're struggling and we've got to get back on the road. Um, there's just too much waste of resources. There's uh, too much um, uh, false news that goes around and, and people have to sift through a lot of noise before they can get to the people like OPA or the communities um, and work with them. Okay, uh, thanks, Kirsten. That area that we have highlighted there, you see the Sabi Sand Game Reserve, um, and you see the Manuleti, and then uh, you see the Kruger National Park uh, that cuts into the, the southern uh, area where we work. But the, the, uh, the green highlighted area 
is where we're focusing and where we are hoping to conduct needs analyses in the the 50 odd communities that are there um, and and so then we would be in a position to aggregate all of those needs and come up with a prioritized investment schedule which can be fed into um, your your regional development plan uh, for that Bushbuck Ridge Hazy View area um, and it just equips people when they do the uh, the budgets for this area to to focus on what the real needs are so that's that's our next challenge and we will be looking locally and internationally to get resources to do this with the objective of it being a it's it's a, a relatively small area in the south african context but uh, it's a significant uh, 50 communities if we can get that right uh, it sets a blueprint for the rest of South Africa. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's where we've been working for 25 years. And uh, the methodology that we use is um, coming up next. Thanks, uh, Kirsten. The first thing that we do is we go um, into a community, as is the case with Dixie. We went in, we met with the Induna. And we told them what what we 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 do. Uh, the needs analysis uh, really uh, was born in the Dixie community because very soon you have all of these conflicting cries, or not conflicting cries, but cries for assistance. And the question is, which which need do you address first? Um, and and then we started working with. Um, the working out the methodology which is to interview each adult uh one-on-one -on -one by members of the community we don't bring anybody from outside we we go in and we facilitate the process so we would meet firstly with the induna and the leadership structures such as a cdf uh, the, the community policing forum in some cases have taken over the role of the cdf um, and then churches, uh, church groups in the communities, uh, the the youth forum, um, and then yeah, if there's a strong women's farming group, then we'll meet with them, um, and explain to them what we're going to do. Thanks, Kirsten. After we've um, met with the community leadership structures. We then have a, a, a mass meeting with all the uh, um, the community members in that community. So, and that is to explain to them what uh, we've basically explained to the uh, the Induna and the leadership structures. And and there's often there's excitement. Uh, somebody is listening and very often the councillors represent maybe 20 or 30 communities and they, they generally tend to favour their own communities. So um, the municipalities do not have a big presence on the ground. They have uh, a presence insofar as bulk in infrastructure is, is concerned. But the, the nitty gritty and nuts and bolts of a daily functioning community uh, is lost on municipalities. They just don't have the capacity or the manpower to do it. And so we believe there's a lot of synergy with what we do and what the vision of the municipalities should be. Uh, we meet with the, the, the communities in public um, and everybody can vent their views. Uh, and at that meeting, we explain to them how we want to go about conducting the needs analyses. We explain the what I'm explaining to you today. Uh, and we then hire uh, interviewers to do one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews in their community. And we, we typically find that the youth are the ones that do these interviews. We get them, if they have matric maths and matric English, those are the people that we, we target. And 
the community development forum then generally takes over and allocates streets or blocks in a community to specific um, interviewers who who then go from door to door um, and interview individuals. The reason why we go door to door is at Dixie, we had the first public meeting and everybody was shouting. As I said, the, the kids wanted, the young men wanted soccer field, the, the young mothers wanted a crash, um, everybody wanted water, uh, there was a dispute over electricity, the people wanted electricity, um, but there was no consensus because the people that shouted the loudest were, they drowned out the other people who maybe weren't that uh, way inclined to stand up and speak. So we then went and uh, developed this process where you are interviewed in the comfort of your home by somebody that you know. Uh, and we have a, a relatively simple questionnaire which has evolved over the 25 years and gives us exactly the information that we want. Um, those needs then that are expressed in that uh, needs analysis are aggregated and we end up with a, a simple one, one page graph where you can clearly see what the priorities and the biggest needs are. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, all right, we can move to the next one. Like I said, that the the, um, the interviewer recruitment selection and training um, recruitment and selection generally takes place at that uh, public meeting. But we ask um, the potential interviewers to to articulate why they would like to do this, um, and and just get a feel for their hearts. Um, and again, the purpose is to make sure that we have interviewers who can listen carefully, one, and two, um, to draw out information. Um, we then uh, appoint the interviewers and then we train them. The training process is not long. Uh, it, it would take an afternoon, uh, typically, uh, or a morning. And um, the, the key is that we encourage them to listen and not to put words into people's mouths or into their minds. So when we get to the, the core of this needs analysis, we say to the, the person being interviewed, if something could happen in this community today, that your that would make your heart sing what is it we don't say do you need water do you need electricity do you need everybody needs that but we we want to go right into the hearts and minds of these people and say if something could happen that would really make your heart sing what would it be and uh, they might say water or a farm or a tar road or fix the bridge or repair the school or whatever. But the fact is that everybody is putting what's in their hearts onto this piece of paper. Um, and we then uh, take that and, and aggregate it. Um, so we also watch out we, before the people go out to do interviews, we will advance them um, typically we pay about 15 rand per interview. It takes about um, 15 minutes to conduct one of those interviews. Um, and then we get them back and we sit in the office here and we, we go through each one of those. And um, you can see where there's an interviewer that really takes the work seriously. You would find that there might be 21 or 22 needs expressed by one interviewer uh, and then you'd get others whose hearts sounded like they were in it but weren't really because you'll find that they only come up with three needs for the whole community and they would put water tar road uh crash 
And then the next person that they interviewed would be Chris Taro at Water. And so they would just mix them up. And that's obviously no good to us. And those people, when we go back, we uh, give them the forms again and we take some of the best interviewers and ask them to go with them to uh, mop up those those interviews and to make sure that we have really got the heart of the people okay so the um, training is crucial and a follow-up yeah All right. Um, so the, the interviewers go from door to door conducting the interviews in the comfort of each interviewee's home. Um, once, and I've, I've now talked a, a, a little bit about the um, collection analysis and confirmation of the interview data sheets. Whilst we're on this slide, you can see in the background there is the Wissani crash. Um, and uh, that was built entirely. We, we, we asked the Dixie community, what skills do you have here? And what, what is it that you would most like to become uh, or do with your life? Um, what is your vision, your personal vision? Uh, there were five young men that had building experience in Dixie. And... Um, so that was our building team. And then there was one, uh, one of the women there, uh, uh, a young mother who said that she, her, her dream is to become a director of a crash. Um, that was Wanda Causa. And uh, she's going on 25 years now that she's the uh, director of the Wusani crash. And she, she, it's her passion. And she now has 22 other creches uh, that are under her wing. And she's funded by the, 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 the government to oversee these creches. So I cannot stress the importance enough of um, how crucial it is, is to, to listen and to uh, employ the skills and the hearts and the passions that are available within a community. That uh, crash there was built uh, by the, the six people. And um, when I met with them after the meeting, I said, who's the best builder here? And the five all pointed to one person. So I said, all right, well, you're gonna be the head of the, the building group. Um, and and that's that's the, the, the fruits of their labors that you see there. Um, we needed to get bricks uh, to build the crash. So we met with the community afterwards and I said, uh, we, we can buy bricks, say one rand 60 per brick uh, from cash build or whatever hardware store uh, in the region. I said, or oh, we can harvest Dixies blessed with a lot of river sand. And uh, we said, you can either, um, we can buy the bricks or you can manufacture the bricks here. So they said, no, they will manufacture it. And so I, uh, I bought a brick making machine. And then the next week when I went out, there were two big piles of sand. And I said, why do you need these two piles? And they said, no, this is the old people's pile. And that's the young people's pile. So the old people were allowed to harvest sand within uh, say 100 meters of where the crash was going to be built and the young people had to go down towards the river so it was all democratically worked out um, and nothing was imposed on the community they came up with their own solutions their own methods and it worked fabulously okay next one thanks um, kirsten Uh, then the, the specialist work, what we do is uh, I have a team of people that I, I use. It's, it's, it's not electronically recorded in um, the communities as it happens. That could be a way to go, but 
you know, we, we have checks and balances. Like I said earlier, you, you might get one interviewer just come with three needs and another one with 21 needs. So we need to have the, uh, the raw data in hard copy form. Uh, and then we, we aggregate it and, and we've got it down to a fine art. We can uh, do those needs analyses and aggregate those results in um, probably two or three days, uh, but then it's, it's full-time work. Um, and we aggregate it and yeah, we get the results and um, then we prepare a development report that relates to uh, each of those needs. And we identify who uh, in the government or the private sector um, can become involved. So it's a very useful tool once we've done the needs analysis and come up with the results to circulate that to uh, the municipality, to the tribal authorities, to um, to the neighboring lodges. Uh, you know, often tourists come there and they want to go and experience a community and they go out and they, uh, they, they want to know how can we assist this community. Um, at Dixie, it's just worked beautifully because they have, over the years, equipped, um, equipped themselves with uh, computers, with library books, with beds for the little kids to sleep on, um, with pots and pans for their kitchen for feeding. Um, but it's all focused and it comes from the original needs of the community. Uh, they, they love the creche, they just have so much respect for what they've built. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I'm trying to touch on all the benefits of this process, but there are many. Thanks, Kirsten. So we take that uh, one page um, of graph and we, we prepare a report, which we, we do in consultation with uh, the, the community structures. Um, and then we, we write the final report, which is agreed to by them before it's officially signed off. And, um, yeah, then, then the community is enabled and empowered to, to speak. They can speak with authority on what it is that that community really needs. And when you put that graph up, I, I found it, it's just, it's so empowering for a community because they, they see the graph and it just is like a wow moment for them. Um, and it, it galvanizes the community. I remember um, in Seville B, uh, no, Seville, the, the, the community Seville, which is quite close to Dixie, we did the needs analysis and uh, I put up this, this graph and I was, I was really chuffed because I knew that it would be um, well received because it was uh, an aggregation of everyone's needs. And then there was one, one Google who said, but I voted for a church and, and I, uh, I looked and I knew that uh, towards the end of the continuum where, they, where it just doesn't show church or anything, the last 10 uh, votes go into a, a, a bag which is called Ada. And um, so I asked her for her ID number and I'd taken all the interview forms and they always sorted in age. Uh, um, so it's date of birth. And I, I asked her for a date of birth and it took me less than a minute to find um, her interview form. And I said to her, your name is, and she looked, looked at me and was amazed. And so was the community. Um, and I said, yes, you, you did vote for church. He has your number one vote. And I went and showed her. And then I showed her that the number, her church was in the other bag because in Seville B, that, that round of needs analyses, there was only one vote for a church. Um, 
So it's a powerful methodology. Um, it, it demonstrates to the community that everybody's voice has been recorded. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of buy-in. There, there's absolutely total, total buy-in. Okay, Kirsten, next one, thanks. We then present, yeah, we present the findings to the community um, and we tell them that the reports are with their uh, Anduna and with the CDF. Um, you can see in this area and to, to this day still water is a, is a major challenge. This photograph was taken in Huntington um, and this community, they would switch the pump on for two hours in the afternoons. So these community members would come and sit here from eight o'clock in the morning, they make their own little cues. Um, and it is just such a waste of time. And uh, we have a lot of work uh, in this area and indeed in the rest of South Africa. And I believe the only way that we can do it is to, to do proper needs analyses ac across the country. Um, and that's why I think that that area, that, that 3,000 square kilometer area that we've identified is going to be a key um, component in um, setting a blueprint for the rest of South Africa, how, how, how to go about needs analyses. Um, okay, thank you. Next one, Kirsten. Right, so that final report uh, forms a solid foundation for socioeconomic development planning. Um, and, and the point here is that, especially if the results of several neighboring communities are consolidated, um, going to the municipality with one community and saying, this is what this community needs, um, it's, it's not gonna work, you're not gonna, they're not gonna be interested. You have to consolidate uh, needs analyses in a region. Uh, for example, if we take Seville, uh, Dixie, Utah and Athol, which are neighboring communities, all of them express the need for a, a clinic. However, you can't build a clinic in each one of those. You just don't have enough staff, uh, it would just consume way too much money and resources. Um, and the Department of Health, uh, they recognized the need, uh, but they elected to put the clinic into Utah, which is central to the other communities that I mentioned just now, um, Dixie, Athol, uh, Seville, and uh, Athol. And, um, so that's the benefit of, of getting a regional perspective is that everybody has um, uh, a need for a clinic. And when we aggregated all the communities, their clinic was at the top of the list. So yeah, is, there's a, a lot of benefit in doing it methodically like this. Okay, Kirsten, next one. All right, here, here is now basically our our last slide, um, and I, I'll just run through the, um, the, the the main priorities. The first one was electricity. The Dixie community was was fending off a hostile attempt on their land, which is the triangle that lies between the Manioleti and the Sabi Sand, um, and the 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 region was being electrified but the the tribal authority was part of this attempt to take over the land um and so they said no you can only have electricity in 2018 i think it was um so we looked at this and we said all right well what what plan can we make so we we sat under the meeting tree um, in Dixie, and uh, we agreed uh, as a community that we need to go and alert ESCOM to the situation. That was the time that uh, Raul Causa was 
um, the, the chief executive of ESCOM. Um, we, we prepared a letter which was signed by, by the whole community. And we just said to him, here, here are our needs. We, we appended this graph that you see here. Uh, we said, th these are our needs. Everybody was interviewed. Um, please, can you help us? Our kids struggle at night to, to study without, without lights. Um, we can't run our borehole pumps like we'd like to. Um, and we, we got into a car and we drove to a megawatt park. I personally del delivered the letter to Royal Causes um, personal assistant. And they said, um, he got back to us and uh, said they will electrify the Dixie community then in 2003. Uh, and within two weeks, the pylons were in. Um, so it just shows you, it demonstrates how useful this is. If we went and said we need electricity, uh, he would say, well, you know, everybody needs electricity. But when you can see that uh, it's, this is the, the methodology and this really is the top need. Um, so it was two weeks and we had electricity in. The crash, I, I couldn't understand why crash was more important than sweet water, only a little bit, but they had a big problem with water in Dixie and but crash still trumped it. Um, when we looked at the interview forms, we found that there were uh, 34 women with over 50 kids, uh, 52 kids, I think, um, under seven years of age or crash growing, going age. Now, if you, if you relieve 34 mothers of their children for seven, day, uh, seven hours a day and you educating them and you feeding them, it frees up over, I think it was close on 240 hours that per day that those women can do other things. Uh, so that's why, why Crash featured so high. Sweet water was a problem. The, uh, the tanks were leaking, the pipes were leaking. Uh, the community had to uh, cough up money for diesel to, to run a generator to run the pump. Um, and it, it just became a very expensive exercise. So we, uh, we met with uh, Minister Casrols and Junior Portluani, who I referred to earlier, uh, in Pretoria. And uh, I sat in Minister Casrols' office and he said, you know, this is amazing. Why do you do this? And I said, well, um, and that's still my belief is that this is what this country needs is this approach. And um, as a result of that meeting, Junior Portluani and a team of people from Pretoria came down uh, uh, with the instruction that they show Polo Forerunners what the Department of Water Affairs and Forestry was doing. And that the next day uh, we would uh, show them examples of the challenges that the communities have. And uh, within two weeks, the Dixie water supply had been fixed as well. So it was just a radical transformation. You see those first three, three bars. Um, those are the biggest needs, but conversely, that's also where the community feels the most pain. So if you take those three bars away, the community is a lot better off. Um, the clinic was built uh, it's about three kilometers down the road from Dixie. So they, they now have a fully functional clinic and um, the Utah clinic runs very well. The Dixie Lodge, uh, there was this attempt on their land and there might still be a lodge coming in. Uh, the high school is, uh, the kids have to go to Manyangana High School in Utah. And they don't like that because it's a long walk every day to and from. So what we're looking at now is um, as part of the Dixie Lodge is that there would be a bus um, to take the kids to and from school every day. Uh, the, the soccer field is in and uh, yeah, with cell phones now, uh, the reception is still a problem there. 
uh, the spas, a shop and cafe, that really is a private enterprise thing. Uh, so, but yeah, that, that in a nutshell is the methodology that we employ and, and I hope that I've demonstrated to you um, how powerful a tool uh, this needs analysis process is. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Like I am having a bit of a wow moment right now. Uh, that was it was very powerful and a very phenomenal talk on so many levels. It's not just what you are doing, the way you are doing it, your reason for doing it. I think everybody here will agree. So thank you very much. Thank I see you. We've already, yes, I see we've already got questions. Um, and I see Dr. Uncle's face already, so we'll still get around there. Um, okay, so I am going to start with Kirsten and then move on to Anna, and then I'm going to go to the chat. Thanks, Aisha, and thanks, Paul. Um, as usual, I absolutely love hearing about your work. Um, for the rest of you, I knew Paul 30 years ago, 20, let's say 25 years ago, and I worked with him a little bit in the areas that he works um, and was very inspired by his work. Um, Paul, I've got a couple of things. I wanted to ask you, uh, sort of top of my mind, is that most of these, uh, most of our audience has a focus on environment and environmental awareness raising. Um, is there, um, yeah, do you think that people already have some kind of appreciation of their environments or is this something that one can in some way include in the needs assessment process? Or yeah, do you think it's not necessary? Yeah, I, I think that um, we, we include it to the extent that we ask the community members what uh, their skills and training are. So we, we're picking up through that. We, we, we can tell you that in this community, these are the people that um, work in the various lodges. Um, and, and this is the sort of work that they do. Um, and, you know, just in Dixie, there's people that man cameras for National Geographic where they, um, and for the afternoon drives, safaris and everything. Uh, and as far as uh, environmental education in the communities is concerned, I think that there is a lot more that can be done there. Uh, the problem being though, that a lot of these communities have been lumped into uh, very small areas, and uh, it it, it kind of makes it difficult to to be environmentally responsible in that environment. Um, but yes, there's a lot of work that that still needs to be done there. Okay, and Paul, um, just a, um, a request for a little story from you. Um, I know you've told us a lot, but. Um, I know you had this amazing story of how you first got into the work that you're doing. Um, I just remember something about um, you going into the communities and seeing kids playing with um, made up balls, I don't know, plastic bags with newspaper stuffed in them or something, and that you then um, brought them real balls. And that that's, I think that was kind of a little bit of a catalyst for you. Yeah, it, it certainly was, you know, I was just, I was intrigued by um, the goodwill of these community members. Um, they they just they made a plan, and uh, so often we would see. Uh, I went to Land Rover the one day, and I said, "Look, you know, I need a decent vehicle to go and do this work." And um, they found, and and Moira Moses, who was the MD, then said to me. Or well, come tomorrow and we'll give you a Land Rover. And I got a brand new double cab Land Rover. And uh, with the instruction that every time it got to 14,000 Ks, uh, I was to return it and get another one. Um, so this Land Rover became a, a focal point for these kids. They started seeing it more and more in the communities. And yeah, I saw in each community there was always four or five soccer balls, which were um, checkers or spa bags filled with straw. And these kids would have these soccer matches um, with this plastic packet with straw. 
and I, I went into the spa and I, I saw that they were, those days I think they were selling at eight rand each. So I would just load a whole lot into the Land Rover and, um, and wherever I saw kids playing with uh, a, um, a soccer, uh, with, a, with a plastic packet with straw, I would just, I wouldn't even stop, I'd just throw out a ball and uh, carry on to my meetings and then um, come back three hours later and there would be half the community and all these kids playing a big soccer tournament. Um, and then eventually I, I, I took one of my directors out, co-directors to go and show him. And he was just astounded. He said to me, he said, he's gonna bring his kids here. They need to see how the other half of South Africa lives, uh, which they did. Um, but they would run after the, the, the Land Rover and shout ball, ball, ball. And he thought they were shouting Paul. And he said, wow, these kids know you well. I said, no, it's the, <laughs> it's the soccer balls. They're shouting ball, not Paul. Um, but yeah. yeah, that was a nice little story. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, nice is an understatement, Paul. It's a beautiful story. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask Anna, because her hand was up. And then um, Asima. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to then ask you to um, read your question. Uh, if you don't want to show your video and ask it yourself, I'll read it out for you. But just be prepared after Anna. And then we're going to move to Dr. Cheryl, of course. <laughs> so, Anna. Okay. Good morning. Morning, Anna. So, I'm Anna Masambuga, a HET student. So on behalf of all TT students, I would like to thank you for such an interesting and informative talk you just had with us. It is so amazing to hear and learn about all the great things you do for the community. And it is also inspiring to us. At the same time, you got to learn about the importance of listening and not just like helping. And not only did you, did you not just listen and analyze all the problems, but you also provided them with the solutions, skills and training and also help them like with their skills to help the community around. And you make sure um, you make use of the skills um, that they had. So we would like to thank you for such a great job that you're doing and keep on doing it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. I appreciate that. Thank you. I think Anna put into, the, into words what all of us are thinking. I think we're all <laughs> feeling a bit <laughs> emotional now. Um, Asima. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Uh, Asima, are you okay with asking your question? Uh, so I basically have a little bit series of questions. Um, but first things first, um, I would like to thank him for coming out and giving us this exceptional talk and um, taking out his time basically to give us this wonderful talk. Okay, so the first question that I have is basically we know that you need, uh, we need to basically be able to communicate with the community and all of those kind of things. So I wanted to know how do you deal then with the cultural or language barrier as sometimes it can be a, uh, a problem to have like effective communication. So how do you actually deal with it to, 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 in order not to have like any miscommunication with them? That's a very good question, Asima. And, um... It's one that uh, is a challenge a lot of the time, the language barrier. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that we have too much of a, a culture barrier because we, you know, as I said earlier in the presentation, we really just facilitate the process um, and we don't get too involved with the cultural aspects, although it, it, it is a big component which you must be acutely aware of. Okay, so yeah, we need to be acutely aware of the um, uh, cultural aspects, which we are. For example, when we did the Bala World land claims, um, which was a 14-year program where um, we had to go out into the community um, identify where the homesteads were before they were destroyed, and then um, 
and and part of that process was to identify graves and um, the community said to me uh, or the previous owners of that land they were kicked off the land in the 1950s and they said to me they want to uh, I would just walk with them and then they would go and go to the graves and attend to the graves and then they said to me no no but this is how we greet our ancestors and I, I was very humble and and I just I listened intently and yeah it it was just such an amazing experience but you need to be sensitive to that at all times um, with the Mbombela Stadium case we we also had um, it was a long haul um, and uh, I was very honored that uh, the the chief uh, Phineas Mdluli um, of the um, Matsafeni Trust, he and his elders, uh, they, they called me the one night before we went to the High Court, they had a prayer meeting and invited me to go there to Matafin and, and, and pray before join this prayer meeting, which we did. And um, uh, at that meeting, him and there was about 40 elders, they, um, they said, look, they respect my, my family name, um, but they, they, they don't know how to say thank you for the work that we've done. Uh, that, that was a, a project that I did with Richard Spur um, in the High Court. And um, they, they, um, they christened both of us. They gave us traditional names. So I go by the name of Umvalasi Mdluli uh, when I'm out in those communities. And uh, there's still quite a few people that... Uh, referred to me as Mvalasi. So you've got to be sensitive to the culture um, and, and respect it um, in this process, but it, it doesn't really affect the outcomes of the methodology. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, and then I have another question. <laughs> okay, so, Siva, yeah. Siva. Okay, so I wanted to know how long does it take to actually conduct um, a need analysis because as we know, time management is very important. And often managers feel that the extra effort basically to complete a training need analysis is like a waste of time and that they could just simply like implement an assumed training requirement. So I want you to know like, how do you go about it and like how long would it actually take to conduct its specific um, need analysis? Uh, Seema, if I, if I had to do a needs analysis um, of those 53 communities, uh, 54 communities in that 3,000 square kilometer area, I guess it would take me, it's all a function of your, your personnel and how, um, who you can spread out into those areas. But yeah, I would, I would say maximum 18 months to to present the final report okay and then, but that's um, a big area that's that's um, probably 500,000 people okay and then uh, <laughs> I have another question so um, basically I was checking out your graph and basically when you were giving like the questionnaires and the interview and then as when you're responding to basically giving them the the necessities I saw that you were giving them like, for example, the, the crashes and the electricities and all the other things you uh, are first. Um, why did you choose it in that specific manner instead of going according to the uh, basic needs as it is like, you know, according to the human rights, like um, every human should have education, they should have um, free water, electricity. So the main priorities are basically those ones. So I see that was above the water and the electricity and education was I think fourth of the fourth one why was it so yeah I, I think that um, it, it goes without saying that those are, are basic human rights yes, um, yes. but um, like I said to you you see those graphs there um, uh, and, and those blue lines, they, 
uh, that's for presentations to the government and everything. But it also, those are actually deep red lines because uh, that, that reflects the pain of the community. It reflects uh, the inability of the government to, to fulfill its mandate to, to give uh, the education and the water. And so it, on the one hand, it, it, it shows what the biggest needs are. But the converse of that is it, it reflects the greatest pain within that community. So, yeah, um, does that answer your question, Asima? And then with regards to the electricity that was implemented in, two, in 2003, after you went back basically to evaluate it, uh, were the people satisfied? Um, did, was it helpful? And uh, did they experience any kind of maybe difficulties or any issues that arise um, after it was implemented? Just, just Asima, sorry, I, I lost you in the beginning of that question. <laughs> okay, so the electricity basically, uh, you say that you went, they needed the, the electricity and then it was given to that specific community, right? So um, I want to know that after you went back to evaluate it, to actually check um, that, okay, was there any problem that the people maybe were facing after they received the electricity or were they satisfied and happy about it? Oh yeah, no, that's an ongoing process. These needs analyses are are almost like exclamation marks on my relationship with the various communities. It just, it brings together um, all the mines at a point in time. They were all happy with the electricity. Uh, the, the tribal authority was trying to uh, force the community to uh, give up their land in return for electricity. And that was a, a totally unfair trade. Um, and uh, I didn't know about the challenges with their land until we had gone through the needs analysis process. We then ended up going to um, the High Court and where we confirmed the community's rights to their land. And, and in fact, um, Dixie, the Makoleki and one other case went to the Constitutional Court um, in 2010, where the, the full bench of the Constitutional Court ruled the Communal Land Rights Act uh, unconstitutional in its entirety. Because of the way that uh, it was worded and because it would give the, the tribal authorities power over all land and the communities would just be subject to uh, these tribal authorities many of whom were established under the, the apartheid government. Um, so yeah, they, they were happy, but um, you know, the tribal authority tried to hold a gun to their head. And so we started innocently in 2000, in the year 2000, Kirsten was there a few times with me, but um, we uh, very soon uh, realized the gravity of of all of this is that you have to go through this process to get to the real heartbeat and pulse of a community and, and to properly identify and understand where the pain is. Thank you, Asima. Um, I, as we move to Dr. Cheryl, Paul, I want to ask you, um, what is the meaning of Umvulasi? Is there a special meaning behind it? And Velasi is a, um, I was very honored. Uh, in fact, I get goosebumps just thinking of it now. And Velasi Mdluli was the paramount chief of Swaziland. And that was Phineas Mdluli's grandfather. And he said to me, I want to give you um, uh, my grandfather's name. And apparently it means wise. We'll agree. <laughs> we'll agree with that. <laughs> um, Dr. Cheryl, good morning. <laughs> Hi, um, Dr. Paul, you are amazing. You are an amazing Hello, speaker. And good morning, and thank you for doing this for my students. Sorry, that's uh -huh. my son screaming in the background. Um, yo, every time I speak to you is just one big learning curve. That's all what I can say. 
um, in I've started a community project um, in 1998, and I started my first need assessment there, like a raw young girl. And um, slowly I built up to an amazing need assessment. And one of the questions that As Asima asked is, how long does it take? Well, my last need assessment at Indumo took 18 months. And you said it, it would take about 18 months, but I did so many different types of target groups. I did the Isendunas, which are crucial because they are the tribal leaders. Then I did the school learners, grade threes, sevens and eights in 21 schools. And then I did the caregivers and the, the males and the teachers, and it just carried on and carried on. And I always, with my supervisor, we said, let's try and get saturation. And still to this day, I don't know what is saturation when it comes to all these questionnaires and focus groups and um, interviews and drawings. I mean, because we use so many different kinds of methods to get all the data that we needed. I mean, I ended up with 2,500 school learners um, data, which we did twice because I did it before and after. And then of course I did all the ism donors, all the tribal leaders and continue for, um, it's one big amazing story. And yes, um, many years ago, I was also given or christened a name and my Zulu name is Numzamu, the one who tries and never gives up. It doesn't say the one who's wise, <laughs> the one who just keeps trying. Um, and also when they say to you, pull or ball, um, I get ipape, ipape when I keep driving through the communities. And that's one of the porridge that we are distributing throughout the community. And that shows the need. Um, but just to show you from your graph, I've got the same very similar um, important ones. I did two different graphs. The one, the most important was water, followed by transportation to schools. Then I had clinics, then I had electricity, and then I had skills training because 63% of the ladies that I interviewed and 64, I think if I'm under correction there, of the men that I interviewed said they needed skills training because not many went to school because the schools were so far. So they asked for special needs and skills. So yeah, I just want to find out, um, how did you code your open-ended questions? Um, when you ask that special question, what will make your heart sing? And I think that's one of the most amazing questions that I've ever heard, because it's not asking what are your needs? It's asking what will make your heart sing. So, Paul, thank you. And um, I don't know how you coded your open-ended question because that is difficult because you've got either a one for this kind of answer, a two for that kind of answer. So you can actually kind of get some kind of um, data coming out of it. Okay, um, Cheryl, yeah, that's a good good question. And to, to get a the results aggregated what we did was what would make your heart sing if the number one vote um what typically most people would put four or five uh needs that that would make their heart sing and you can see it in that dixie graph you know the you take away those first five points uh, and then all the pain uh, much of the pain is gone out of dixie so yeah. what we we decided was um, uh, if if your number one priority uh, is whatever, uh, and you you put it down as one, uh, we give that vote five points. Your number two vote, we give four points. Your number three vote, we give three points. Number four vote two uh, two points, and number five vote one point. After you go past five, I I don't I, I think that they they just trying to think you know oh, what else um, yeah you know but you you can rest assured that the top five votes are, are well thought out. Uh, often you'd only get three, uh, but they would score five, four, and three, um, and then we aggregate that, and then you get that beautiful picture. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's how we code it. It's, it's a very simple coding process. Yeah. One of the questions I asked them is what 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 negative things do you do to the environment and what positive things do you do to the environment? And you should have seen the answers. And we also got the top down from some of them admitted to, to littering and washing in rivers and burning of waste. But they also told me the good things is that they plant trees and they collect seeds and they start muti gardens and stuff like that. So um, there's amazing stuff which the community is doing and you know, they can make a difference in their own lives and they're doing it. And sometimes they just need um, that little bit of encouragement and the reward systems. And But also, yeah, I know the ball story. Um, I've seen children wrap plastic bags to make a ball. And I've also had a whole lot of balls um, distributed in the community. And I'm telling you, one ball can make a big difference to a child's life because soccer is one of the most amazing sports out there and it just puts a smile on a child's face. And kicking a, a round ball made from plastic bags, geez, I've never seen a child kick that ball so hard. And I'm telling you, we've got some amazing Bafana Bafanas out there and I'm telling you, one day we're going to have a whole team from Indumu coming out and they're going to be in the top. So, but thank you all <laughs> just from my side. Thank you, thank you. I'll learn every time and I hope you don't mind. I'm going to be ringing on your bell so many times and um, I'm sure my students have benefited greatly. And I've got a few advanced students linking on today as well. And I'm telling you, thank you, Paul. That's all I can say. Thank you for being so passionate and being so dynamic. Thank you. It's my absolute pleasure. And there is a... Um a web page uh, for Paul of Forerunners uh, and, and there is uh, the opportunity to to send emails through that Paul of Forerunners web page uh, and I'll respond to those. Okay, I'm also just putting the QR code to get to that web page. It's on my screen right now. Uh, I'm going to go, we've got 15 minutes left, so I'm going to go with Ishmael and then Kwane. Then I'm going to go into the chat because there's a bunch of questions in the chat. So, Ishmael, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, I'll be quick. My name is Kwamend and thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, mine is more comment and uh, very thankful for such a topic <clears throat> because for me, in many years of working in conservation, uh, I believe nature has no problem. The problem is a species called Homo sapien, which is us as people. And um, <clears throat> what I have observed in my experience is that uh, NGOs are very powerful, powerful in enhancing the necessary change that we are looking for. And I want to encourage such initiative to you know, to grow up and, and having more and more because uh, they, they are more flexible. Uh, they can take decision and make changes rather than some of us who are working in institutions that for them to make changes, they take quite a long time and, and red tapes. And the challenge uh, <clears throat> that I have often seen is uh, with the NGOs is when it comes to scaling, when the you know the the maturity of the NGO reach a plateau and uh, there is no innovation, but I think the more we engage in this platform, we'll be able to share what then to do so that uh, scaling can be appropriate and even sustaining the work towards the the real impact in terms of theory of change. And uh, from this observation, I therefore encourage we those who are in institutions that are formalized to create a strategic partnership with NGOs so that we may quicken our delivery before the target date. Uh, the other point is that, uh, you know, looking at the evolution, think, uh, I'm guessing there are more students here than, than non-student. Uh, uh, and I, I wish one can share this with them that uh, I personally I've observed that the history of conservation industry have shifted from protected protectionism 
to inclusive approach where you know community develop development and social economic uh, uh, issues and challenges become more important and i've often realized that our our institution of higher learning uh, are often not very strong in preparing this young and energetic student when they come to industry to be able to deliver in that context and it's very necessary to also as as individual realize that we need to know uh, a little bit uh, more up outside of our, our 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 kind of industry because people and social economic development is becoming a buzzword internationally uh, and i love the the i, I like the, the 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 naming and that uh, you know i think uh, in every community i've worked with they'll have a tendency of giving you a name and 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 the meaning of a name is very important as your self-assessment as the assessor of the people. And, and that meaning uh, can also inform you to say, now that I'm here, what changes, what improvement should I do? I don't want to tell the name that I was, I was once in the call when I was doing this. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Ishmael. Thank you, Ishmael. Um, I'm gonna go to, um, and then I'm going to go to the chat because Mr. Devlin, you've got so many compliments in the chat, so we're going to move there afterwards. So thank you. Could could I'm, I just I'm trying. Um, could I just yes, of uh, course. Asima um, talked earlier. I think it was you, Asima, about uh, culture and language. Uh, language is a challenge, um, and I, I didn't pick up on that, but. Um, I just want you to know that uh, we we do um, when we have our first meetings with the community. I keep my uh, presentation short, and they it then gets translated for the benefit of those who might not be so good at English language. Um, we're busy with a big project at the moment on land rights. Um, and it, it involves the Dixie community again and uh, quite a few others um, where we, we, we're developing a community land rights handbook. Um, and that handbook is a distillation of um, all the key principles that communities need to be aware of when they're faced with somebody trying to take their land. And that handbook, um, is going to be translated. So far, we, we're thinking of doing three different languages, um, but it, it, it will enable uh, communities to navigate uh, more comfortably through that minefield. So yeah, language is a, is a challenge and we, we are acutely aware of that and we do try and address it. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, um, I can see there's quite a lot of TT students here, so let me just briefly um, introduce myself. My name is Juani Rachweni. I am from the University of Johannesburg, and I am doing my final year of my Master's in Environmental Management, and I'm also working for Johannesburg City Parks and Zoos. Um, so mine is more of a comment from the, the session that we just had. So throughout my... Um, um, research project. So my project is based, um, it's um, focusing on community-based ecological restoration of a wetland in El Dorado Park. So what I've just realized is that, um, well, this is from observations, that rural communities are more well-connected and structured in such a way that people honor meetings as scheduled by their community leadership structures. Um, the, my observation is that, or my thinking is that, um, rural communities are less politicized. Hence, when people are being called for meetings by their indoors or their chiefs, then they do honor that. Um, whereas on the other side, urban communities, people mostly just mind their own business. So I've had multiple stakeholder meetings with, with um, the communities and um, the communities is always, uh, the communities in the uh, urban areas, um, the turnover is always really, really, really bad. And um, due to those disparities and 
um, with regards to the needs analysis, um, I believe that perhaps we should um, focus more on finding other methodologies um, when it comes to um, these two um, um, sides of the coin of which is the urban and rural communities, whereas rural communities are um, easy to navigate through because the structure is um, just clear and people adhere to it. Um, so yeah, um, I just believe that we should focus more on other methodologies because I've tried a lot. Um, um, we've done community meetings, we've done river cleanups, we've communicated through social media, and you find that people just do not um, attend any of the sessions that we had planned. Whereas during those sessions, you will find people just um, lingering around the streets and just minding their own businesses and just going on by that day and not even caring about what the meeting was about. So that's all I just wanted to say. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kwani. That's a good, good comment. I, I think that uh, if you look at the process and methodology that we employ at a, at a different level, it's, 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 it's aimed at developing a relationship with the community. Um, and that's why we go with the community structures first and we get the blessing of the leadership. Um, and I, I've not had one community say, no, we don't wanna know what we need. Um, mm -hmm. they, they welcome it. And, um, and then the, you know, appointing um, interviews from within the community, that in itself is building a relationship with that community uh, and, and those, interviewers uh they get paid for their time and their effort and so the whole the whole process um um is is aimed at building a relationship then you look at for example the 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 young men at dixie who became the building team um there was just in the space of 15 minutes we had a building team we had a, a manager of the building team and then they stand there and they see a structure which was built by their, their own hands. But at the same time, the old gogos come past there and they say, I harvested the sand for those bricks. So it, it's, it's, it's about relationships. And the key before you get to the business end of this is to, to establish a relationship. And I, Kwani, I, I'm not sure how you would do that in an urban setting where you're looking after a wetland or you're looking after a, uh, a river or, or trying to clean it up because there's just so many different motives. Uh, here in, in, in the rural settings, uh, it just, yeah, it just, it's so much easier for me to, to build the relationships and get the motivation. Uh, you have a big challenge there and, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll apply my mind to it, um, but yeah, you've you've raised a very good point. Thank you. Only, Kwane, and um, Mr. Debrain. So I think I'm going to go to Bianca first and ask you to unmute, um, because we have five minutes left, and then I'll go into the questions in the chat. And then I'll go to Johan as well, who has a question in the chat. <laughs> Good morning. Um, sorry Good morning, about that. <laughs> um, you just had a look at my morning coffee. But anyway, um, Mr. Brian, I would like to ask you, it's probably a bit of a stupid question, but with first coming into these communities and starting these projects, we're helping them and building um more of a community unit where they can improve things did were they in any way skeptical at the beginning and open to your help or was it more of like a a challenge to get them to open up towards you to come in and help them um yeah that's that's basically my question yeah it's a good question thanks bianca um when we we started this work it was um yeah at the beginning of 2000 we had an enormous amount of support from from various government departments and from sandparks um and 
yeah, they they fixed the Dixie water within two weeks, but then they also accelerated the uh, the installation of big pipelines from the Sabi River and in Yaka Dam to um, to those communities where we operate, and so it, it wasn't empty promises. Once once we'd articulated the needs, we were able to rely on support to address those needs. Um, lately, um, and quite rightfully so, we, we have many service delivery protests on all the entrances to the Kruger National Park. And um, the communities get get cynical because they say we've, we've been asking for this year in and year out. And so we're not interested. And, and there's been a few cases where I've gone in to do the needs analyses. Uh, one of the lodges appointed us to do uh, three needs analyses in 2018. And the, the old people were just saying, yeah, you know, we, we sign these papers and we do these things and nothing happens. Um, so there is, there is a level of frustration uh, that has built over the years. And it's not because of, um, you know, our methodology or anything. It's just that they, they've become despondent uh, and rightfully so. If, if we were sitting in those areas um, and uh, we had to put up with water supplies that hadn't worked for 15 years, You'd also you'd also become a bit cynical. So, but we try and manage that. Um, and you know, I'm blessed that I've been doing this for 25 years in in all of those communities, and uh, most of them know who who I am and uh, and who my team is. Um, so, yeah, it's it it's it's a good point. Um, it's it's getting worse, um, and and we really need to, as South Africans and you as uh, potential graduates coming out or uh, post grads, we need to we need to get this. We need to find the road again. Um, and and my belief is is that we focus on that one area. Um, we have a couple of universities overseas who are interested, um, but we need to get it rolling. But then we need to get government buy-in, and that is difficult under today's political circumstances, as you are all well aware. Um, I don't know how we're going to get that buy-in. We wanted it to be a presidential lead project, um, but uh, yeah, it's fallen on deaf ears for now, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Mr. Moreno. I appreciate the answer, and that answers my question. Okay, Bianca, thank you. Thank you so much. And then with that, I'm going to start reading the questions in the chat. Or let me start with a comment. First comment is Luane, who spoke to us last week. And she states that the importance of stakeholder engagement crucial and is crucial and well implemented. We come, see, adapt, and learn together without imposing and forcing things to the people. Yes, I think that's key um, to your work. So well done, Paul. Amazing work. And that is from Luane. I'm going to, I think I'm going to ask Johan's question last regarding the bird. Um, uh, Mr. Debrain, let's just see. That's a thank you, Mr. Debrain, for a great talk. It was very educational and enlightening. Thank you. And that is from Musawini Kors, Musawin Korsi. Um, my apologies if I don't pronounce names correctly. Then we have one from Daniel Yobert. Good morning. Thank you for the talk. We really appreciate it. Do you find that poaching in these communities around the reserves is a big problem? And after doing an in and executing these needs assessments, has it changed poaching activity? That's interesting. Um, so Mr. Debrain? Yeah, poaching is a uh, is a problem not not so much in the communities, but certainly in the reserves. Um, and the, uh, there's been a lot of rhino poaching, especially, um, and uh, that is just 
purely commercial and the people, the community members know who, who the suspects are and uh, there's, they have channels whereby they can feed back that information, especially on the rhino poaching. There are, um, there are folk that go and poach antelope um, and that's for food. Um, and I, th I think it just gets back to relationships, you know, and um, if, if, if there are relationships between the conservation organizations, such as the Sabi Sand Game Reserve, Manya Leti, um, Kruger Park, uh, are good with the, the neighboring communities, um, then, then that can be reduced or mitigated against. But yeah, you're always going to get poaching, whether it's around these communities or, or anywhere else. Um, you see it down the Cape in the sea. Um, you, um, there's one, one, one case that came up earlier uh, where um, Isi Mangoliso, I was invited by a community down to Sodwana and uh, they had just put up a huge fence and said that, no, this is a protected marine reserve. You can't fish here anymore. And the communities had been finish, fishing there for 200 years, you know, with lions. Uh, it wasn't netting. It wasn't, um, it wasn't decimating the fish. And those are the sort of things that we have to look out for, that you, you accommodate communities and keep the relationships going. Um, and uh, yeah, I knew uh, Nick Steele was the the head of of that um, organization. Um, and yeah, he we we discussed that, and um, yeah, the, it it softened a bit. But poaching is is always bad. But um, you need to be sensitive to the community's needs as well. What is poaching, and what is sustainable harvesting? I, I'm maybe wrong in saying this, but I think one of the reasons for poaching happening is the struggles of the community. So this is eating at the source of the problem. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go to uh, now, who says, good morning, and thank you for the inspirational talk and highlighting the interconnectedness of the SDGs and that it is possible to facilitate more goals and achieve a greater outcome afterwards. My question is, how are you able to remain a researcher in the needs assessment and not become so, some sort of therapist as is advised against? So, Just say that again, the, the therapist part. Yeah, it's, uh, the question is, how are you able to remain a researcher in needs assessment and not become a type of therapist in inverted commas? Yeah, I, I think that we, um, um, I think perhaps, you can... uh, we, we, we have, um, we have a couple of universities doing research through us and that's always their challenge is, you know, you, you've got the pure research, um, but what flows from there and what I'm trying to encourage universities to do is what they refer to as high impact research. In other words, uh, yes, you do the research, but then you don't just put your findings on a shelf. You take those findings and you, you turn them into solutions. And um, I, I think the last time I counted, there's, there's 11 of the SDGs that we touch um, with the work that we do. Um, so yeah, there, there is definitely, you, you can't become a therapist. Um, we don't see it as that. We, we, we like to think of it as high impact research where we can identify the problems, but at the same time, and, and for that we use, uh, we, we've started a partnership with Sheffield and Bristol and Tukies um, probably five years ago now, and they do the pure research and uh, we, we do, we do co-research with them, but we, 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 uh, follow our developmental mandate uh, to use that to assist communities. Does that answer the question? I think it does. Um, I'm not sure if the Borges here. 
but I'm still, I still need to go through as many of the questions as you can. So I'm just going to read a comment. This is from Prudence. Prudence has no question, but she wants to say, thank you for the presentation, Paul. I have personally seen your work with the community researchers in Utah, and I'm so inspired to see that your work is still continuing. Grateful to know that we, as young researchers, have access to people like you and have done the, that have done the work, and we can learn from you. Definitely agree with that. Um, right. Thank you, Prudence. And then uh, Pabalo Mukhini from TUT, good morning, and thank you for such an insightful talk. You mentioned a questionnaire that had evolved over years when conducting interviews for the needs analysis and a methodology you employed that works for your program. As a future conservator, what advice? would you give me with regards to developing and coming up with a methodology or strategy that would work for me? Should I see the need to establish a community development program in communities around protected areas that I'll be working at? That is Babalo. Yeah, um, Babalo, I think that what, what you will see in uh, the Paul of Forerunners case is that it's, it's, it, it evolves every day that you're involved and you know you you can't take a solution off the shelf and say okay great we're going to do this now um because as as we said earlier um you it's about listening it's about going into a community and just sitting and not saying anything often in the beginning uh, i would go out to communities and i would just listen um and they would come up with all sorts of things. Um, and, and that's where I realized that you, you and, and this has come up a couple of times today about expectations. What is it that you can do and what is it that you, you can't do? So Babala, I think that uh, there's no one size fits all. Um, you need to let it evolve and spend time with communities, um, understand what your objectives are and um, and how can you marry those and integrate them with with the community and their needs uh, it's a two-way flow and that's crucial for me in the beginning it was just a, a one-way flow quite frankly from the communities to portal forerunners we just had to absorb 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 uh, and then over time you start getting the ideas and the methodology on how to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know Dr. Sherrill is going to be in a rush soon, so I'm going to ask it to unmute. Um, then I'm going to ask Johan to unmute to ask his question, and I think we're going to end up after that. I hope I covered all the questions in the chat. So Dr. Sherrill, yeah, and then Johan. When it came to the poaching issues, um, my my grade sevens and my grade eights um, actually told me everything. Um, and I know it comes down to the first two SDGs, um, poverty and um, the hunger issues. And um, the reason why the grade sevens and the grade eights were involved in the poaching is because they couldn't be arrested or or anything. Nothing could actually happen to them. And their parents and their uncles were sending them in to do that. And they knew it was wrong, um, but they also needed the survival issues. And that's where the skills training came in. And they were they even told me the different methods that they used. And it wasn't just snares. They were hunting with dogs. And they were out in the protected area and out in the communities. And, um, yeah, I, I learned a hell of a lot. And as you said, one of the key things is, is to listen. And... Um, Many times the children used to split, if I use that word, on their parents and say, Numzamo, listen, dad has just gone into the reserve now to go and snare. You must catch him and you must educate him. So the children knew and they were well aware of it. But um, you have to be, you know where the line is um, and you have to just understand where it's coming from. And yeah, that's where the skills training all came in because if we can bring in chicken farms and we can bring in vegetable farming, um, they don't really need to go in and um, poach. So, yeah, we're looking at subsistence poaching, where it's for um, protein to put on the table. 
and we've had so many workshops on this and uh, just a story that comes to mind is an 80 year old on one of the workshops he actually broke down in tears and he said you know Namzamo all these years from the time I was a, a, a young boy my parents taught me to go out and go and get meat then yama but to put, put, put on the table and he says today is the first day I realized and he used the word biodiversity and he said he has had a huge impact on the biodiversity and he's been snaring and he's been using the red daker and he's been using the Sunni and he's been using this to put meat on the table and today is the day he's going to go home and educate his family so the message did get out there but that's all through need assessments um, just through listening and to understand and to evolve and to get the information out there but thank you Paul and I'm going to have to run now um, mm -hmm. and thank you for everything that you've done and please I will be in contact with you and I think we could actually get some kind of collaboration going if you if you are available to assist in the Nduma Community Project and other projects as well. But thank yeah, you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. There you can see all my bells and whistles telling me to get my going. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. Thank, you, you, thank again. you, guys. And once again, to my students, thank you for being so dedicated and thank you to the Share Screen team. You are amazing and always will be. And I yeah. am so glad to know you yeah, guys. Yeah. And Paul, this is not the end of this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you thank dr you. ogilvy all right. bye guys <laughs> bye dr ogilvy um just quickly i think for the final question now this is now on the topic of listening and somebody who's been really listening has been one who wants to know uh, mr de brain the birds in the background he wants to know is it a kingfisher that you want me to unmute you to ask it <laughs> yeah it is it is it's the grey-headed kingfisher. He, he's got a, a nest. Uh, there's an embankment, just as you look at me, um, this way, um, about ten meters from here. And they had two chicks this year. And then the other bird that was calling just now was the Cape Batters. Um, and yeah, we we've got about a hundred and fifty birds that I've recorded here. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul, for that little conservation story. Uh, and we have a crowned eagle. He killed a dussie here the other day. And we had a caracal just uh, 80 meters from here killed a, a rock hyrax. Um, it's a while back now. but um, And then we get white-tailed mongooses. I've seen honey badger. Um, about 5K is out of town. So it's a, a stunning place, yeah. Shows you how much um, conservation can happen on a small piece of land. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. So all. I think on that, Johan, it just shows just how much of a difference one person can make. So we all thank you very much for that. This is a phenomenal, a phenomenal talk. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy anytime if there's any students that want to contact me. Uh, go through the web page um i think that you've put up that uh, yeah okay mm -hmm. so you're most welcome and i'll answer as quickly as i can on any uh, inquiries so i can make it a bit bigger just if anyone wants to go to the web page now so yeah i think thank you um with that kirsten any closing words Oh, I just want to say a huge thank you, Paul. Um, yeah, my absolute heartfelt appreciation. You make my heart sing. <laughs> so that's all I need to say. Thank you. Um, my heart sings when I'm able to share this methodology with people. It really does. Um, I think it's an important uh, foundation stone for the future of South Africa. If, if we all just had to take this approach of listening and go back to you know, the principles of Ubuntu and respect and respect for the environment, respect for the economy and for rural communities and our conservation areas. That's the key. Thank you. Very well said. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Kristen. Yes. And I think with that, we're going to close soon. Thank you to our audience. Um, those still here, we really appreciate it.